You saw the thumbnail, so I'm going to give you exactly what you want right away. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about this very unique instrument, the Jerry Jones Guitarlin, which was loaned to me graciously by a subscriber of the channel named Chris. He has a really cool Instagram that shows a lot of similar instruments. I'll link it right here. Now, regular supporters of the channel know that I always complain or rave about upper fret access, and the haters of the channel swear that every guitar I pick, whether it's modern or vintage inspired, is ugly. So this guitar, is perfect for the channel because you can say it checks off both boxes, it has a lot of frets, upper fret access, and some may think it is ugly. Hey babe. Yeah? What do you think of this guitar? It's ugly. Now, we are going to do our usual nitpicking about this guitar because in my opinion, it's more of a piece of history than anything else, but it does sound really good and it does have an interesting history. So first we're going to discuss the history of the Electro and this guitar, and then we'll get into some tones, talk about upper fret access and all of that stuff. Now, although this is not a Dane Electro guitar, the history of this guitar obviously starts with the Dane Electro Company, which was founded in 1947 by Nathan Daniel in my state of New Jersey. He previously designed and made Epiphone's Electar amp series, and he also pioneered the first tremolo amplifier. After years of designing amplifiers in the early 1950s, he was approached by Sears to design a budget-friendly model of electric guitar that was aimed at beginners. And this is where things start to get interesting. So we have to remember that in the 1950s, the solid body electric guitar was still a very new modern concept. For example, in the late 1940s, Paul Bigsby and Les Paul, and yes, the actual people who made the Les Paul guitar and the Bigsby vibrato system, they were collaborating on their own guitar. Of course, Leo Fender released the Esquire in 1950, and his Stratocaster in 1954. 1954 is also the year that the Dane Electro Company released their first budget guitars. Now, to keep prices low, Dane Electro made the front and back of their guitars out of masonite, which is an inexpensive composite material created by pressure molding steamed wood fibers. And instead of being reinforced by an adjustable truss rod like most other guitars, these very, very thin popular necks had two heavy-duty steel bars that were installed in them. In other words, Data Electro pioneered both the composite body and this reinforced necks that are made not to move. So I guess all of the modern guitar stuff that I'm so fond of really isn't that new. The pickups contained Alnico magnets and were housed in metal tubes made for dispensing lipstick, which is why we call them lipstick pickups today. Now I said Data Electro was creating budget guitars, so let's discuss price. The original guitar Lynn was sold for $150 in 1958 which is $1,473 in today's money. At the same time, the most inexpensive Fender model, the Esquire, was about the same price, but the Fender Stratocaster, you know, with the tremolo system, that was $230 or $2,258 in today's money. Until 1958, the intellectual guitars had a single cutaway body that was similar to a Les Paul or a Telecaster, and they were finished in several bright automotive colors. In 1958, they shifted to a double cutaway design, and the more extreme one like this is called the Longhorn, and the less radical looking one was called the Shorthorn model. In addition to electric guitars, the company also made six string basses, four string basses, double neck instruments, and the guitar lin, which is the instrument we're talking about today. Now, the guitar lin is a mix of two different words, guitar and mandolin, and the whole idea of this instrument was that you could have the range of a guitar and also the range of a mandolin all in one instrument. And then we have this extreme long horn cutaway to get up to the 31st fret. We have to remember that at this time in US history, the banjo and the mandolin were far more popular than the electric guitar. And the electric guitar was getting a lot of converts from that instrument. Ultimately, the guitar lin was a little bit too radical and awkward for most guitar players, which we're going to talk about today. So it didn't sell very well, and only about 200 were made between 1958 and 1968. That being said, while doing research for this instrument, for this video, I really have a newfound respect for Dane Electro, the company, and Daniel Nathan, or Nathan Daniel, the person. In addition to pioneering the composite body, the necks, a movable necks, right, all of these technologies, Dane Electro also had 
a unique electronics that I actually use today as well. So they would have two knobs, two stack knobs, so that you can have volume and tone for each pickup, but only use the space of two controls, which again, as I said, I use a lot today because it helps to save space on the body of the guitar. But today we don't have an original Dan Electro. We actually have a Jerry Jones model. And essentially Jerry Jones made higher quality remodels of Dan Electro designs in the 90s and early 2000s. And of course they have the same essence, they have the same materials, they have a lot of the same colors and all of that stuff, but they are made at a higher quality with more modern technologies. Of course, one difference we have with electronics is we only have master volume, master tone, three-way switch, but again, this is essentially what that guitar, the original guitar, then looked like. The first thing we should talk about is these lipstick pickups. They sound very bright and very beautiful on a clean tone. And then when we throw on a little bit of grit, the guitar stays very, very clear and it has a chime to it. I really like how it sounds with distortion as well. I said I wouldn't nitpick, but we have to, of course, talk about this upper fret access for a few different reasons. Uh, number one, although technically we can get all the way up to the 31st fret, if we were doing anything that required a lot of hand motion, we would instantly be hitting the long horn as we were playing. So although I think it looks really cool and the horn allows you to still rest it on your leg, all of this horn is really in the way of playing unless we're not moving our hand much at all. Actually, even just holding chords, you'll hear that I scraped the long horn. Then again, people always say that I have big hands, so maybe if you have smaller hands, that wouldn't happen to you. Not to mention the fact that as we get up the fretboard, these frets, of course, get incredibly small. And I'll show you an example right now, but it's almost impossible for you to play the 31st fret just because of how thin it actually is. So I didn't even realize this before, but when we're playing way up here, that actually hurts. It hurts a lot to hold the string down at this tension all the way up here. And that's probably why all the other companies who all the other companies, all the other companies who try to do these style of guitars with a ton of extra frets, I mean, it's just not a design that's popular anymore, and that's probably why. That being said, Although we might actually not play these upper frets a lot, it does have one unique usage, at least one that I could think of. So you might know the technique called harp harmonics, whereby we fret a string or a chord, and then we go 12 frets up from that particular chord or string and play a harmonic. If we want to use that technique, it works really, really well from frets 1 to 12, because if a guitar is 24 frets, we can see all the places where we need to use the harmonic. However, if we wanted to use the harp harmonic technique above the 12th fret, let's say on fret, I don't know, 13 and 15, at that point on a regular guitar, we'd have to guess where the harmonic was because we wouldn't be able to see it because there's only 24 frets usually or less even. But since we have frets all the way up to 31, when I want to do the same harp harmonic technique, I can easily see exactly where my finger should be. Anyway, as you can tell, I don't really have the creativity 
or the hands to do this guitar actual justice. But I hope you enjoyed our history talk. And thank you again to Chris for loaning this instrument. And if you have any weird, rare, or cool instruments you want to see on the channel, of course, head over to my website, send me an email, we can talk, and I would love to review your cool instrument. There's also a gear playlist right up here you should check out. By the way, I'm Andre Flood, and I'll talk to you soon.